So the secondary stamp sands are different than the primary ones. You can see all the bedding that's in here and there. They're the same kind of bed forms that we see in the Jacobsville, you know, channels and, and stuff like this that, that were, I mean, what they did is they captured the, the tobacco river that's down here. Oh yeah, notice uh, on the shoreline, you can see an outcrop of the Jacobsville right over there and with no stamp sand cover. And so, so this fan that was here, it didn't go that way. It went that way. And, and the reason it goes that way it has to do with the lake currents and the Coriolis. Uh, do, do, does everyone know what, what I mean by Coriolis? The fact that the, e, the equatorial uh, region uh, is, I, I mean, be, that, that the earth rotates and that in the equatorial region, the places that go farther to the south are actually accelerating faster than places farther to the north, and that leads to uh, the development of currents in all lakes in the northern hemisphere such that material moves anti-clockwise around the edge of the lake, and, and this affects Lake Superior. And because we have a peninsula that sticks out in it, it causes the, that force to be magnified because it gets the, the flow lines get compressed around the end of the peninsula. So it's quite strong here and it's moving that way even when there's no wind. So today, even though there's not a lot of wind driving it, the stamp sand is inching its way toward Big Traverse from here. Yeah. And it's eroding back that. The, so. the current is pushing us at two tenths of a knot right now with no wind. Okay, so he has measurements of that. That's great. And so, uh, you know, in the wall there, there's birds' nests and all sorts of active things. If you, um, you know, so, so you can imagine uh, the way this feature was. It was just dumped out in the lake, but it doesn't stay in one place. It's been moving constantly since then. It will move. It will keep on moving for centuries. And, and uh, people have looked, for example, in the deepest part of the lake, they find the gay sands in the deepest part of the lake. You know, so it's moved everywhere. It's been dispersed all over the lake. It's down around Barriga. And, and so that's an interesting thing. But there's more that's interesting about the gay sands. The gay sands are different than all the other stamp sands in... Uh, in this area because they contain a lot of arsenic, natural arsenic. And that's something of concern that hasn't really been fully investigated. Uh, arsenic is poison. I think everyone knows that it's poison. You can, if you can, uh, especially if you can get it in solution, it's got a lot of danger uh, to things. And But arsenic is chemically complex. It exists in a lot of different valence forms, meaning the way it bonds to other species and the kinds of species it can make in solution are quite varied and and they depend on the chemical situation. So sometimes it dissolves and sometimes it doesn't. And we don't know very much about those conditions here. We know there's a lot of arsenic in the sands in solid form. We don't know very much about how much of it dissolves and creates toxic effects. There are toxic effects that come from copper and other components within the sands here, but those effects are not as serious as in many mining wastes because the sulfide content of these is, is rather low. But arsenic is a whole nother uh, question and it's partly because we haven't done holistic evaluation of the hazards of these mining wastes in the way that's needed. And that's nobody's fault. I'm not pointing the finger at anyone except that environmental problems involve investigation by many, many different kinds of specialists. We all have to participate. We all have to admit what we know and don't know and be willing to undertake parts of the investigation where we don't know where they lead and where they go. And it should be part of our citizen activity 
and too many people are just sitting on the sidelines and hoping that this problem goes away. It's not going to go away. There are proposals now to remove these stamp sands. It's a huge volume. I don't know the number of the volume, but it's very, very costly. And <coughs> what drives that removal? How much material is going to be removed? How disturbing is it going to be? Where? What are the impacts of doing something like that? We should all participate in this. And do we really want to remove it? Do we want to cover it? What are the possibilities for uh, solving um, the environmental, uh, environmentally detrimental aspects of this? Uh, and indeed, what are the environmentally de detrimental aspects of this? We don't really understand that. So, so here, while we're here, you can see the scarps and the area that's being eroded. That gives you a sense of the dimensions of what I will call the primary um, stamp sand deposit. If you look beyond, you can see a little narrow point that is to the left, sort of in the direction of Big Traverse, and on this side of Big Traverse Bay. That is secondary stamp sand.